Eh, buenas tardes, les damos la bienvenida a esta primera eh, jornada historiográfica de este semestre que tiene como invitada especial a la doctora Lucy Ryan, profesora del Instituto Universitario de Florencia, quien estudia una serie de temas vinculados con la historia italiana del siglo XIX, historia comparada, historia global, y en particular hoy vamos a hablar de un tema muy interesante para nosotros, que en realidad Bajo Chaparro va a introducir, Bajo va a ser la presentación de la doctora, y del tema que simplemente quería eh, darle la bienvenida, agradecerle su presencia y darle la bienvenida a ustedes en esta primera jornada de este semestre. Eh, paso, por favor. Bienvenidos a todos y todas a esta jornada historiográfica. Eh, la doctora Rey es profesora de Historia Comparada de Europa durante los siglos XIX y XX en la European University, University Institute de Florencia, Italia, editora de las revistas Journal of Modern European History y European History Quarterly, entre otros cargos. Cuenta con un bachillerato en Government y History en la London School of Economics y Political Science y una maestría en Sociología Política en la misma institución. Su doctorado en Historia lo obtuvo en la Universidad de Cambridge. Sus temas de investigación se centran, entre otros temas, en la historia del colonialismo europeo, la biografía, la cultura y la política interna. Entre su, número, entre su numerosa producción académica incluye además artículos y capítulos de libros en importantes revistas y casas editoriales, Destacan sus libros Andrew the Volcano, Revolution in a Sicilian Town, Resurgimiento, The History of Italia from Napoleon to Nation State, Garibaldi, Invention of a Hero, Italian Sexualities and the Uncovered. Eh, ha sido merecedora de numerosos premios de investigación, destacando los otorgados por la British Academy, The Leverhulme Trust, New Field Social Science y la Cambridge Historical Society. La presencia de la doctora Rayo ha sido requerida en numerosas ocasiones en diversos medios de comunicación, en televisión y radio, ha participado en programas y entrevistas de la BBC y de la radio televisión italiana y otros medios de este país. A su vez ha dado entrevistas a los periódicos La República, Corriere de la Sera, Giornelli di Sicilia, Il Focchio e Il Palindromo. Thank you very much um, for inviting me. I'm sorry I'm speaking in English. Um, I hope we were discussing before we came in, uh, and so I hope very much to come back next year. And I, my ambition or my plan would be to give next year a seminar in Spanish. Um, I can understand Spanish really quite well, so if you want to ask questions, please ask them in Spanish. Um, so, this is not Antonio Raimondi, you can see. <laughs> So that's my first, the, I've, yeah, <laughs> I've now got your attention, it's quite good. Um, so I'm going to start instead with Giuseppe Garibaldi, um, and uh, there's a reason uh, that I choose this particular picture, um, is that this is Giuseppe Garibaldi in Rome in 1849, um, and as it, what I want you particularly to notice is his uh, dress, his clothing. Um, which is basically the, a, an adaptation of a clothing of a South American gaucho, okay? Um, and that's sort of the beginning. This is the kind of the hint of, of, of where my interest comes from for Raimondi and Peru, okay? But let me start by telling you uh, a little bit about the book I wrote on Garibaldi 10 years ago. When I wrote it 10 years ago, I was under the influence particularly of cultural history, and I was interested in why and how Garibaldi had become so famous in the 19th century. How this man, really from, from nothing, um, and indeed particularly not even from Italy, from um, Uruguay, um, had become so famous in the course of the 19th century. That was the first question. And what uses his fame was put to. So why he was, you know, what, what I'm, I'm interested in short in the construction or what I call the invention of a nationalist hero for political purposes, okay? That was, and um, this is an example of a print that was widely diffused of this newly famous man. Now, on the whole, I was very pleased with what I did. I thought I'd done well. Um, I felt that I'd put forward a new interpretation of Garibaldi, 
and of 19th century European nationalism, of why, how it was used, how heroes are used in nationalist cults. And in particular, I, I, I studied him across, not just in Italy, but across Europe and in the Americas. So I looked at his worldwide fame. It left me with an enduring interest in uh, biography. Um, and then at the same time, I went on to work on Sicily, the new project I did, increased my interest in global history. Okay, So that's the starting point from today, is how you fit together biography and global history. So if I was going to write this book today, I would write it in a completely different way. Okay, So 10 years has changed everything. Also in sort of historiography, we've kind of moved from being cultural historians to global historians. Um, and I've already written a couple of articles about Garibaldi and how his global experiences, so his own travels, if you like, first of all as a merchant sailor in the Mediterranean, and then as a political exile and soldier in Brazil and Uruguay, um, enabled him to establish a kind of multicultural appeal. So that he, according to the audience he was in front of, um, he tailored his look. This is another picture of him from um, Rome. It's a watercolor from Rome in 1849, done by a British artist. Um, and the man behind Garibaldi is a, a Brazilian freed slave who Garibaldi brought back to Rome with him. And this was, um, I think one of the points is that for, you have to imagine that for um, uh, European audiences in the middle of the 19th century, this was just impossibly exotic, okay? But actually, within five years, he's completely changed his image. And he looks much more, when he goes to the United States, he becomes much more of a kind of severe sort of Protestant gentleman, okay? So Garibaldi's own fame is connected to his global experiences. But um, I've been, I've, so I've become much more interested in Garibaldi as a kind of global figure. And in particular now, and this is where I get closer to where we are today, um, I'm interested in this so-called, what's called in the sort of nationalist um, way of speaking, it's called Garibaldi's second exile between 1850 and 1854 when he travels first to New York and then to the Pacific coast of South America and across the Pacific Ocean to East Asia. Now, interestingly, this period of this journey, if you like, around the Pacific is by far the most obscure of Garibaldi's career. It's generally considered the least interesting, okay? And Generally, what people say is that he ha there was a tragedy in his personal life. His wife dies. And basically, the, the kind of, if you read the biographies of Garibaldi, he disappears. Okay? So, like, basically, Gar this period, we don't know anything. He just disappears into the Pacific. So, before we think about this disappearing, I want to actually show you the journey, because the journey is kind of interesting. So, in 1852, this is the first bit of the journey. He travels from New York, where he's living, um, uh, to um, Central America, to Nicaragua. And, and, and he crosses Nicaragua into the Pacific um, and arrives in Lima, in Callao. Um, from in Callao, he picks up a boat with a friend of his from Genoa. Um, a man called Francesco Carpeneta, and they cross the Pacific. Um, sorry about this, it's a very, it's a European map, so the Pacific is cut in half. I apologize. When I, again, when I come back next year, I'll have a map with the Pacific in it. <laughs> but the person who did it for me never occurred to them that the Pacific should be in the middle. Anyway, um, and he crosses uh, the Pacific with a cargo of guano, which they first try and... Um, try to sell and fail to sell in Canton and Hong Kong. And they subsequently sail north um, to the uh, Taiwan Strait and manage to sell the guano in Amoy, present-day Xiamen. 
He then, I don't know, I hope you can see this, it's, the map is a bit too large. They then travel south to Manila and back up to Canton uh, before crossing the Pacific via, as you can see, Tasmania um, and New Zealand, um, arriving back in Callao in January 1853. Okay, so that's a, that's a big journey across the Pacific. Um, from Callao, he travels south to Valparaíso, returning then up to Callao with a cargo of copper, and finally picks up a cargo of textiles and in Callao, in Lima again, um, and goes down via Cape Horn all the way up to Boston, arriving there in September 1853, from where, and bear with me, sorry, he goes back to New York. And from New York, he receives the news that he's allowed back to Europe. He's been expelled from Europe because of his revolutionary activities. Arrives in London. From London, he goes up to Newcastle in the north of England to collect a cargo of coal, um, which he then, and then finally travels back to London and all around um, back finally in 1854 to his home in Nice, okay? Now, these travels of Garibaldi is actually, in fact, relatively difficult even to piece this together. They don't fit into the narrative of his life. As I say, even at the time, everyone's saying Garibaldi's disappeared. And they're generally considered to only be of anecdotal interest um, to people who are obsessed by Garibaldi. There are a lot of people who are obsessed by Garibaldi. And so the kind of question is, for example, one of the conferences I've been to by Garibaldi is, did Garibaldi go to Cuba, right? You know, and this is like a discussion that went on for an hour about whether Garibaldi went to Cuba or not. But why this is interesting is only because you know, people are obsessed by Garibaldi. However, actually, I've come to think about these travels and the importance of these travels and of where he goes in a very different way. And in particular, I'm struck by, while his fame is all about how extraordinary Garibaldi is, okay, so his extraordinary kind of, what he himself calls his vita tempestuosa, okay, you know, that he's exceptional, you know, he's a hero, um, actually, that this, this journey is probably the most typical thing about his life, right? There's actually nothing extraordinary about his life, this journey, and he certainly doesn't disappear, okay? Why do I say that? Well, first of all, as a native of Liguria, which is this area around Nice and Genoa, and a man who had trained as a young age as a merchant sailor, Garibaldi was first and foremost part of an extended merchant and migrant network of, uh, of Ligurians with Genoa at its center in Latin America. I mean, this is not something that I need to tell you because it's something that you know, but it's not something that Italians or Europeans know. These so-called Geno Genovese were the largest migrant group, of course, in Rio de la Plata, which is where Garibaldi lives in the 1830s and 40s. And again, as we know, there were significant, powerful and growing colonies of merchants, of Genoese merchants and entrepreneurs in both Valparaíso and in Lima Callao during this period. It's this commercial trading network that explains why Garibaldi went to Peru in 1851 and why he, the, and the whole aspect of his journey. The Pacific route that he takes and the second reason for his journey to Peru and across the Pacific is even more simple, if you know, um, which is that Garibaldi had no money. He had three young children, his wife was dead, they were, children were back in Nice. He had absolutely no money at all, and he needed, and he, all his letters of the period are obsessed not by politics, but by the need to make money. And Peru was the place to go and do this, all his friends told him, because of the boom in Guano. Okay? Moreover, on the return journey from um, Canton, Manila, to Lima, 
Uh, and this is a huge, hugely controversial topic for political reasons, actually. It's said that Garibaldi transported Chinese workers, or coolies, to Peru to work in the Guano Islands. Peru, of course, was in need of these workers because despite the efforts to attract European migrants, efforts that gathered force after Garibaldi's departure and continued right to the 1920s, they had been unable to do so in sufficient numbers. Finally, one of the, arguably one of the reasons why so many coolies, these Chinese workers, were prepared to come to Peru was, was connected to the immense disruption caused by the Taiping Rebellion in China. So they were all trying to leave China. So far from being this disappearing, irrelevant episode in his life, Garibaldi's journey reflects and sheds light on global networks of culture and trade, um, which have very different geographical centers than um, historians of Europe necessarily, or of, and of Garibaldi necessarily are aware of. Now there are many ways and directions and conclusions that I can draw from this, and in fact that's one of the problems I was telling colleagues here about this. You know, one of my problems is how to actually contain this global history into something that's manageable. But what I've become particularly interested in is how 19 or some 19th century Europeans whose life is defined by these new opportunities for mobility and migration make connections, adapt to local and global conditions in order to establish wealth and influence for themselves in several different South American republics in this period. These people often, they're often soldiers, they're sometimes scientists, engineers, entrepreneurs, or they're sometimes all of these things, actually, they shift from one job to the other. My argument are that these are agents of globalization, drivers in the expansion of European economic power, and intermediaries in, and carriers of knowledge between Europe and the Americas. Okay, to go back to Garibaldi, another issue that preoccupies the fans, the admirers of Garibaldi is whom he met while he was in Peru. Who did Garibaldi see? What did he do? And particularly whether or not he met one man in particular, and here we come to Antonio Raimondi. Did he meet Antonio Raimondi or not? This is something that preoccupies fans of Garibaldi. Now, let me just introduce you, just remind you of who Antonio Raimondi is. Um, he was an Italian scientist um, from Milan, um, who although some 20 years younger than Garibaldi, Garibaldi was born in 1807, Raimondi in 1824. He, like Garibaldi, had fought in the 1848-49 revolutions and indeed fought in the same campaign in Rome that we saw at the beginning in 1849. Like Garibaldi, he leaves Europe for the Americas in the aftermath. He sails from Genoa uh, directly for Lima with his friend and colleague Alessandro Arrigoni and arrives there after a long sea voyage around Cape Horn in 1851. So he's already actually relatively unusual because most of the Italians stop in um, Buenos Aires. But he actually seemingly, and this is something that is interesting about Raimondi, he seemingly, he, he has decided before he leaves that he wants to go to Peru. The problem with Raimondi, actually a little bit like Garibaldi, is that they're both, um, or he is very, seems to be very aware of his image, of his, the career aspects of his life. So he's notoriously private. We know very little, actually, about his personal motivations. What we know about his personal motivations for going to Peru, he writes really quite late in his life. So in other words, it's not, he, we don't have letters from the period explaining why he goes. We have a kind of post uh, arrival after he's been in Peru for 30 years in which he explains. In reality, it's possible that Garibaldi and Raimondi don't meet 
for very simple reason, uh, Garibaldi is a revolutionary and a democrat. Raimondi is in fact a moderate liberal, and they're very, very different political, um, one very different set of political ideas, but also there's a particularly bad feeling between moderate liberals and democrats in Italy at this time. So it's really quite possible they didn't meet. But the question of whether they met, again, is more of anecdotal interest because the careers of both men exemplify the global role uh, that Genoa continued to play in the 19th century, or particularly the role that it continued to play in South America in the 19th century. So Raimondi is, of course, part of a scientific network from Milan. Garibaldi is part of a merchant network from Liguria. However, Genoa links them because Raimondi leaves from Genoa. He leaves with Arigoni from Genoa, and it's a Genoese doctor, a man called Emanuele Solari, who gets Raimondi his first job in the Faculty of Medicine in Lima. So he relies heavily on this Genoese network. Um, um, also, uh, so let me now just move slightly again back to Raimondi. Uh, Raimondi arrives, as I said, in Callao in July 1850, and he stays there until his death in 1890, so he stays there for 40 years. He marries a Peruvian woman, um, and his voluminous scientific publications are written in Spanish. From his correspondence, he actually loses his Italian. In fact, it's really interesting, I was reading letters from him uh, and his diaries from him last week, and already, so he, already in, in 1852, 1853, he's writing in Spanish, um, and his letters already make uh, significant mistakes in the Italian. In other words, these kind of, if it's, it reminds me of me trying to speak Spanish, that my Italian words creep in. Well, he's doing the other way around. When he writes in, in, in Italian to his Italian friends back in Milan, he's got all of these Italian, uh, sorry, Spanish words in there. So he, he gets, he becomes Hispanic in terms of his, his language. He's also extremely successful. Um, between 1850 and 1869, it's Raimondi who personally explores, surveys, and maps Peruvian national territory. Part of a methodology to experience, record reality, the geographical reality in Peru. As you all know, the knowledge is eventually formalized into a eventually seven volume encyclopedia about Peru and also in the first national map of the Republic, which is published in Paris between 1887 and 1900. He becomes, and this is where I become, so I'm not primarily a historian of science. For me, what's also very interesting about him is not just the scientific achievements, but that he becomes a prominent member of the new Peruvian liberal establishment and is part of the moment of so-called civilizing reform started in the mid-19th century and which is brought to the end, an end by the War of the Pacific. And indeed, the famous encyclopedia is produced with the help of his friend Manuel Pardo, the first democratically elected president of Peru. Most interesting for me, however, is he's involved in several infrastructural projects in northern and central Peru, working with the US railway magnate Henry Miggs. The most successful project was the construction of the, the railway linking Lima to Ancash province, which again you'll probably know, until 10 years ago was still the highest railway in the world, where there were huge mineral deposits, but no way of getting them out of the mountains. Here, Raimondi was paid by Meigs and through the intermediary of Ernesto Malinowski, the engineer on the railroad, to work as a kind of informal prospector. He explored the region and published a scientific volume on El Departamento de Ancash, which behind the scientific analysis of the minerals in the mountains was a massive propaganda exercise in favor of developing the mines, building the railway, and establishing settlements for the mining community.
and service industries. And this is a wonderful watercolour by Raimondi of the town of Moracocha, um, which is, again, you'll know, still the focus of massive mining interests. The pictures, actually, if you look, it's really an interesting thing to compare this, this watercolour by Raimondi with the pictures of what the mountain looks today. The mountain, this one, has now half disappeared through mining. Um, and it's the town which most, some of you will know, the Chinese company which now owns the mine has moved the workers to a new town some 10 kilometers away. And actually, <clears throat> the reason why I mention that is, in a way, this is the beginning of the project which is still going on in Moracocha because Ra Raimondi was involved in a scheme to try to... This is, in fact, the, the, some of this is um, uh, idealized, the, the, um, the villages and, the, and the, the, the factory in the middle, this is Raimondi's imagining of what it's going to look like if they manage to bring in the workers to the town. So it, this, it's still, if you like, the focus, still today the focus of colonial interest, but even at the time is the focus of colonial interest. It's, in general, it's not that successful. The scheme to bring in Europeans into this area does not work. Um, Italians who do move in uh, end up being given salaried jobs rather than being given land. The idea was that they were going to bring in Italians and French to grow um, crops, to grow food for the miners that were working in there. But the Italians decide they don't want to do that. They want to have salaried jobs instead. Uh, then, of course, with the war, of the Pacific, the government runs out of money for the irrigation and infrastructural projects. And in particular, the tensions grow between the Peruvian and Italian government about the future of the Italians in this area. Um, so the literature on these kinds of schemes, and this is one, often dismisses the kind of their importance because they're not particularly successful. And it's argued um, they're irrelevant. The attempt to bring in Europeans into the mountains are irrelevant because it's the, numerically <clears throat> doesn't compare to the mass migrations into the port cities at the end of the century. Um, I think this is a mistake for a number of reasons, in part because some of these schemes do work, both in Peru but also in Chile and Argentina. These kinds of planned settlement schemes work. But in part also because they tell us a great deal about colonial ideas in the early to mid 19th century and about ideas of migration and whiteness before the mass migrations into South America in the late 19th century. A study of these schemes, like this scheme in Moracocha, a scheme which had to be sold and so produced a great deal of literature, both in Peru, uh, but also in Italy, tells us a great deal about the link between colonialism on the one hand and migration on the other. And given they are based on a vision of European economic hegemony or power, offer several insights into the varieties of European empire before the scramble for Africa in the late 19th century. So they also change, I think, the, both our chronology and geography of empire. But let me return before I describe a little bit more about the kind of general um, uh, framework for this analysis. Let me return to Garibaldi, Giuseppe Garibaldi and Antonio Raimondi. Raimondi is a national hero in Peru, but he's virtually unknown in Italy. Um, so Garibaldi is one of Italy's founding fathers. Raimondi is, uh, is a founding father of his adopted nation, Peru. Through his scientific research, he supplies the Peruvian Republic with, exactly like Garibaldi, with a foundation story. Based in part to Peru, based on part with the, the idea that the Republic of Peru is linked to a single continuum with a heroic and civilized Inca past. Raimondi, one of my favorite quotes from Raimondi, when he visits Cusco, is he says, Cusco is the Rome 
of the Americas, right? So this is clear that although Raimondi is, becomes Peruvian, his kind of idea of the, nation, of the Peruvian nation is in some ways extremely Italian. Um, he helps create a story remarkably like the Italian foundation story in which um, the he heroic future for Peru is based on a heroic civilized past. Um, um, obviously, perhaps also, but he, they're also Garibaldi and uh, Raimondi are similar in terms of their kind of self-presentation as heroic figures. Um, Raimondi is a much more private man than Garibaldi, but nevertheless, I think it's very revealing the way in which he kind of, he uses, in the way in which Garibaldi uses his, his heroic soldier career, Raimondi uses his kind of heroic scientific endeavor to present a particular image of himself and a particular place for himself within the Peruvian Republic. And for this reason, so for the reason that both men present themselves in this way, they've been studied only as part of a national story. But I want to argue, and this is kind of beginning to bring an end to what I've been saying, I want to argue that we cannot hope to make sense of Raimondi's life or Garibaldi's life using this national story. We need to make them part of a global perspective. We can't explain, for example, I mean, this is the most obvious thing I'd say, actually. We can't explain why either Garibaldi or Raimondi went to South America if we keep the national framework. We ignore their romantic fascination that the continent held for Europeans in the 18th and 19th century. We ignore what I've just described, the trading Genoese network that actually physically, materially helped them to get there and to make uh, uh, money while they were there, and we ignore the new opportunity in the 19th century, in the transformation of the 19th century world. The Raimondi simply r disappears from the Italian national narrative, and Garibaldi disappears into the Pacific world. To me, that tells you everything about um, the way in which history has been studied in both, uh, in, both, in both cases. Moreover, or above all, their status as national heroes, defined by their exceptional achievements, there's only one Garibaldi, there's only one Raimondi, establishes a standard narrative that obscures, for me, the really important insights that their lives offer. In particular, that actually, in other ways, both men were really typical. There was nothing extraordinary about them. Garibaldi is representative of a mid-19th century Ligurian or Genoese trader who follows the money around the world. Raimondi, actually, but Raimondi, I think, is even as much is representative of a Quite a typical kind of Lombard, you know, from Milan, moderate liberal, if you like, a romantic technocrat for whom science was a means of social and economic advancement. The more I read about Raimondi, the more he strikes me as having kind of, in a way, exported part of, his, of this Italian moderate liberalism to Peru and mixed it um, in... Um, with the kind of Peruvian um, reality. Moreover, his correspondence shows the extent to which he maintained contacts with scientists in Italy and elsewhere. So it's not true that he disappears. He actually, he actually makes a career for himself as the Peruvian scientist, as the man to go to from, for Europeans in Peru. It's also interesting, this is a very small side point, but too interesting to ignore, that Raimondi has a brother, Timo Leone, who fights with Raimondi in 1848 in Milan and becomes a missionary whose career path is remarkably similar in the sense, but, but Timo Leone goes to the South Pacific and explores the South Pacific as a, as a missionary and ends up as the bishop, the Catholic bishop of Hong Kong and comes over here in the 1870s to meet his brother. So <clears throat> what I'm trying to say there, and I don't have time, 
uh, to, to explain this to you properly, nor have I done yet enough work to be able to explain it to you properly. But there's a network of, if you like, global, global scientists, but also actually global Italians, whose significance is entirely obscured by the focus on national history. Both men finally were migrants. I think this is extremely important. Um, and so, in migration, I've already suggested this in relation to, to Morococcia, so in migration a form of colonization that typifies Italian expansion overseas in the 19th century. There's a huge way, um, uh, develops a whole, a whole kind of policy, a government policy and a way of thinking in which many Italian uh, intellectuals and politicians argue that the movement of people, the movement of money and culture, was a much more important way of, of establishing Italian spheres of, of influence in the world. So, I already mentioned this attempt by Raimondi uh, to bring in Ita Italian farmers to various places of Peru. What I found literally in the last week since I've been here is the involvement of the Italian government uh, in these schemes through a man called Felice Giordano, who was an engineer who in the 1870s is sent around the world by the Italian government in order seemingly to find places that the Italian state could usefully colonize with Italian um, uh, migrants. He publishes a pamphlet on Chanchamaya, on the province of Chan on, in setting up an Italian colony in Chanchamaya. But before he gets to Peru, he stops in Borneo, in Indonesia, um, and attempts there to set up in a colony of Italians in Borneo. Okay? Um, Garibaldi brings the idea of colonies actually back to Europe and establishes a model colony on a deserted island off the coast of Sardinia. Uh, and this is a fascinating picture because he's actually in Sardinia, but the kind of the iconography seems to me extremely, again, is this very strong iconography of the exotic. Okay, so let me conclude by going back to biography. By following the careers or simply the biography of a man like Raimondi, I think we can I, uncover and observe global connections that they made and that made these men. The presence of Raimondi in particular, but also Garibaldi, of also this man Felice Giordano and many others, their presence and the activities of Italian merchants in Peru should mind, remind us, first of all, of the part played by Italians in the making of the global economy in the uh, 19th century. The interesting thing about Italians in the making of the global economy is, of course, the way in which they, again, disappear. Because in the very early 19th century, they're called Geno Genovese, Genovesi. In the middle of the 19th century, they're called Piedmont Piedmontesi, because Genova has become part of the Piedmontese state. And by the second half of the 19th century, they've become Italian. But actually, it's the same groups of merchants. It's not actually, they haven't changed. Essentially, my argument would be most of them are still from Genoa or from Liguria. Um, and in particular, they're a group of very mobile people, as I said already, militiamen, revolutionary entrepreneurs and scientists. They're an elite. That's an interesting point. Compared to the migrants that came at the end of the 19th century, these men are elite, an elite. And they're a kind of professional trading middling elite, a middle class elite, who chase new opportunities for self-promotion. And they interest me because through their often quite specific attempts to make a living, to make money, so Garibaldi's journey around the Pacific that I started with, they don't just reflect a globalized world, they become agents of globalization, drivers in the expansion of European power, intermediaries of European knowledge, and carriers of knowledge of the Americas back to Europe. And they become, as I've described, active promoters of a particular kind of planned colony of settlement. The second point I want to make 
uh, alongside the idea that the, of the part played by Italians in, this, in the making of the 19th century global economy is the role played by Latin America and the Pacific world in this global economy. A trans-Pacific world, indeed, of which Garibaldi's journey is emblematic and Raimondi's journey is emblematic. Um, and I stress both of these points because in the, in the current wave of global history, um, there is far too much attention on either the North Atlantic world or on the Indian subcontinent, okay? And so, while global history um, is remarkable in terms of the way in which it kind of, in theory, expands the scope of our um, analysis, the geographical scope of our analysis, what you find is that when, they talk, when global historians talk about Europe, they're talking about France, and Germany and Great Britain. And when they're talking about um, the Americas, they're talking about the USA and maybe Canada. But there's a whole world, global and globalized world, that's being left out of global history. In that respect, global history um, is remarkably traditional or has the potential of still being remarkably traditional. So what I want to do with this, so I started with Garibaldi and his journey and went on to Raimondi, so I tried to keep it down to sort of not very many people, but actually my ambition uh, would be to use the story of Raimondi um, and his, his activities, not just his scientific activities, but his economic activities in 19th century Peru to change the geography and the chronology of the 19th century, to change about where we think the center of commercial and economic and political activity is. It's not just in London and in New York, it's also in Genoa and in Lima. Um, and also not to see the mid 19th century as a kind of lull in colonial activity, nor as a period of pre-colonialism, or which is very often seen in terms of the history of migrations to um, the Americas as a period before the mass migrations of the late 19th century. I can't tell you how often I read in books about migration to the Americas in the 19th century. There's like a page in which they talk about this period um, finishing by saying, and actually, you know, it's not important, it doesn't succeed, um, you know, because the real expanse is in, from the 1890s onwards. But actually, I think it's extremely important, in part because these, and this is again something we may perhaps talk about, these, these pushes into uh, the Andes in the case of Peru, um, and into the uh, interior in the case of Argentina, that's when they really start to push the indigenous populations back. So that actually the mass migrations of the 19th century wouldn't be possible if it had not been for these colonization schemes before. Um, so I think the mid 19th century, and I think these, uh, if you like, Latin Europe and Latin America are much more important than historians have really um, uh, acknowledged. Um, it's a crucial formative moment in European overseas expansion in which informed by transformative economic, intellectual and infrastructural developments, particularly in the speed of communication, hence the railway, projects of colonialism multiplied and diversified, rose and fell everywhere. So seen in this respect, the nation building schemes in Latin America, the so-called colonial schemes in Latin America, are far from being, as they have often been seen, marginal to the main action, either in North America on the one hand or in Asia on the other, nor should they be seen as a case apart of British and French informal empire, but I think in some ways they should be seen as the main focus of colonial ventures both as the object of planned migration schemes of settler colonialism and as a protagonist of these schemes in its own right. So in other words, uh, making sense 
of Antonio Raimondi, I think has the potential um, to alter the geography and the chronology of the 19th century and to recast, not just, not just to fit Peru or Italy um, into a globalized world, but to actually change our knowledge and our understanding of what globalization and colonialism meant in the 19th century world. Thank you very much. Haremos una ronda de preguntas, así que por favor, dame la mano si quieren tener alguna. Nos veremos. Okay. Uh, I just had a small curiosity. Uh, in your book about Garibaldi, you mentioned that she, that he marries Mina uh, Raimondi. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Sadly, it, no, I don't think there's any, it's quite a common name. Uh, but I haven't, I, I'd love to establish the link, but I haven't. That would be really fantastic. But no, no. <laughs> Thank you, though. Uh, I yeah. Have, I have another question about this scheme. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm just curious about your sources on this, because I was under the impression that this aquarella uh, in Morococha was done uh, uh, it expresses a reality. It was a, oh. a, a, an hacienda by his friend Carlos Luca. Yeah. Uh -huh. Existed. So you said you mentioned this was a plan. Uh, no, I think I think the I'm not I'm not sure the extent to yeah. I mean I don't I, I don't know, but um, I think my point was to actually have a look at it again. It's probably the easiest thing to do. I think the. Uh, I think it's a very idealized image of it. I think that's what I'm saying. Sorry to be clear. Um, and, you know, we could talk about it, but to me, okay, so looking at it with kind of Italian, as it were, Italian eyes, it looks like a kind of, it looks exactly like how a Lom somebody from Lombardy, with their very strong ideas about kind of how uh, agriculture works, it looks to me like, like that, so it's, it's a plan in that respect. Um, but... But, um, yeah, I mean, that, that, that might be something to look at, that, that, might, that might be something to consider, that there's more reality in there than I'm giving it credit for, yeah. Yeah, uh, I, I just mentioned it because I've been in Morocco, right? Oh, you have? Okay, I haven't been. I wanted to go, but I haven't got there, yeah. yeah I, uh, I wrote my thesis about it. Oh, okay, okay, well, <laughs> yeah. Anyways, uh, there are some readings about this, uh, this painting, uh -huh. some local readings. Oh, yeah. About <laughs> what this about how the town was in the past, uh -huh. uh, especially in the context of the, the resettlement. Okay, the yeah. So, uh, they are, some people in Monacoche actually um, tried to rescue this, this image uh, and say that there, there, were, there, were, there were real indigenous people in there. <laughs> okay. It was not related to the I see, I see. That's very interesting. Maybe you could give me the reference to your. I'd like to read that. Actually, that sounds really interesting. I didn't. That's a very. That's, that's an aspect of the kind of politics of the using the politics of the past, which is incredibly interesting. Thank you. Yeah. 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 I have one question. Yes. Um, like, which are the difference? Uh, or you explain more the difference between. Mm -hmm. uh, like, uh, Garibaldi's political ideas and uh, ideas. Yeah, um, that's actually very, it's actually very important. Um, in, uh, well, certainly in 19, to the, Europe in the first half of the 19th century, uh, you have uh, essentially two different groups of liberal opposition. Right to the to the to conservatism, and it comes from the French Revolution. Right, there's the, the there's the radicals, um, who are generally Republicans, and then there are the so-called moderates, of which Raimondi is one, who who want actually gradual reform. Okay, so so it's essentially a, a you know it's a it's a it's a it's a very straight on one level it's a very straightforward division between radical Republicans and moderate reformers. However, um, in Italy and elsewhere, but perhaps particularly in Italy, there's a very strong group of moderate reformers in northern 
northern Italy in particular, so in Piedmont and in Lombardy, so Turin and Milan, who's, who are convinced that political action uh, in and of itself is not, is not really their aim. What they want to do with reform is economic reform by applying kind of scientific principles, particularly to agriculture. So in a way, they're, they're, they're political, but their political activities um, is uh, very concerned with, with uh, science and agriculture. So Raimondi falls very much into that, uh, that group. Whereas Garibaldi is not at all like he's, uh, and and more, most importantly, the final difference would be that they, in in the 1848 revolution, fall out very badly with each other. So there's immense, apart from not agreeing, there's also immense personal and political hostility between them. Yeah. Okay. You recommended that the both President Garibaldi and Raimondi come from General Lombardy, which is our, the industrial tribal. So, okay, so my question is, was there a connection, was there some influence between the great capital of the great industrialists in Italy and maybe their the presidency in Lima? Um. Well, that's a very good question. I think I th uh, so. Raimondi comes from Milan, and Garibaldi comes from Nice, uh, which is now part of France. It was then part of uh, the Genoese, part of Liguria. So, and actually, that is part of it because the industrial triangle is Turin, Milan, and Genoa. However, in uh, the early 19th century, that's just a dream. That's another dream. <laughs> um, and uh, Milan is developing economically, but is not anything like today, okay? And um, it's really, in a way, I think the, li the real links are between Genoa and Lima, actually. It's, this mer it's still a merchant network. Um, and what, I mean, it's something to, I think, uh, essentially, if, if you're in northern Italy in the 19th century uh, and you want to go actually into the Atlantic, so whether you're going to New York or um, Buenos Aires or Lima, the port you tend to do this through is Genoa. Okay? So, that's, so anyone from Milan would go through Genoa. So it's more, it's not, it's, it's, Milan is less important in this period than Genoa is, if that answers your question. Yeah. And then the Stia? Yeah. You can do it. Uh, in the map, you show about Garibaldi's travel. Yeah. Uh, you showed that he went to Valparaiso. Uh, and I heard in a recent conference uh, that in. Uh, yeah. In the mid 90s, Between the community, yeah, uh, and try to uh, establish like uh, bonds and uh, try to uh, show an, an image uh, of themselves as like uh, not like founders like Raymond but like uh, important people that serve the recent community to integrate themselves into the national uh, mm -hmm. uh, community. So I was wondering if um, that kind of strategy to uh, uh, be part of the community was like uh, used by Raimondi uh, in the travels or in the uh, presence in the group, maybe like that, uh, that was his In terms of integrating, but what kind of strategy? Sorry, I haven't understood. To, to, to integrate uh, himself or maybe the, the Italian community yeah. in a more uh, friendly way. More, uh, I see. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't, I mean, there's, there's the trouble, the, tro the trouble that we have, I think, is that, uh, 
there is a, a, a very, there's a big divide uh, in terms of the historiography of, of, of the 18th century and the historiography of the 19th century. Um, and this is, affects our understanding of what Italians, and in this case, again, Genovese, um, do as in terms of a strategy of integration into the community. I mean, if in, it's, and it seems very clear that actually what, that what, there's a very good book which has been written, recently written about the, Gen, the Genoese in, in the late 18th, early 19th century, and it's argued that um, they integrate into the community, they often marry uh, local people, uh, they become part of the local community, in this case, Lima. But that doesn't mean that they stop being, um, um, in some, identifying themselves also in some way as from Genova or from Italy, right? One, I haven't looked at these documents yet, but the, what, the, what the documents I really want to look at are in Turin, uh, which was then the capital of, the, of Liguria, of the whole Ligurian region. And it's the, the reports of consuls in, in Lima and elsewhere about, uh, about the activity um, of Italians, or not Italians, Genoese and so on. Uh, and that would tell you more a bit about these kinds of strategies that you're asking me about. But I think, um, I think that, I think this is why Raimondi is so interesting. Partly because we don't know, because he doesn't, talk <laughs> about himself in this way. So it's actually possible to kind of impose anything on him because we just don't know enough about him and his views. He, he said, but what is clear is, and this is for me, you know, coming from it from the Italian perspective, is although he becomes, he builds up his profile and his power in Peru, he never loses his connections in, um, with Italy. So there's a museum, a very interesting museum in Florence, um, and the first director is a, another Ita ex-Italian revolutionary, um, a man called Paolo Mantegazza, and Mantegazza uh, travels in Argentina at exactly the same time in the 1850s and 1860s, but then he goes back to Florence, and in the Mantegazza archive in Florence, there's all of this evidence of correspondence from Raimondi. And Raimondi sends Mantegazza all his books. Um, so, you know, it's, it's not, I think it's a mistake to think people have to make a choice. I think that's a very 20th century idea. That, you know, you're either from Peru or you're from Italy. Actually, these people are, are, are none of them, they're from, they're from different places. Ga Sorry, and then I'll stop. Garibaldi is a classic example, actually, even more because depending on who he's with, He's a completely different person, you know. When, it, when it's helpful for him to pretend to be an Uruguayan gaucho, a Brazilian gaucho, he does it. When he's helpful, he puts on a suit and cuts his hair, and then he's a lovely Protestant gentleman. So I think this is important, you know, like we all do, actually. I hope that's helpful. Yeah. And then, yeah. <laughs> it's a wonderful presentation. Thank you, Miguel. Thank you. Thank you. And thinking in those terms, when you mentioned the idea of uh, global history, yes. uh, it's like networking is very important. Yeah. In yeah. So when you present that, it was like, a, in my sense, is there is like this networking, like a general yeah. like global networking, but uh, it, it's at the same time like different little ways of doing the networking. Yeah. So how can you see that in terms of comparing, for example, the way uh, Garibaldi created this and had this networking yeah. in comparison to Raimondi, which is more like, uh, it's not as clear or as strong maybe, or, or easy to, to see in comparison to Garibaldi. Yeah. And also something that you mentioned at the end of, of your answer yeah. to the previous question is that the fact that maybe there is like this kind of like group of like Italians who fought in the 1840s and then move all over the world yeah. and they still working among themselves. Yeah. What were their ideas? What were their interests? Yeah. You know, that would be a wonderful... You know. Well, thank you for both of those. You know, the first, the, the first, the answer to the first question, I wish 
I wish I knew the answer. It's what I'm really struggling with, you know? Um, I feel sometimes, I worry sometimes. I'm just following little stories of, of people and their interesting, incredibly interesting lives. And, you know, again, if I was talking to a student, you know, I'd say, you can't do this, you know, you've, what's your point, you know? What? And so, uh, so there's definitely that, that's a worry that I have about these, about what you do with these networks. However, I think in a way you, you already helped me answer the question with the second point, which is that uh, I, there is, and I think there's some other work being done, particularly on Germans, um, who after the 1848 revolutions travel all over the world, basically. And I think there's, and I think, the, the issue there is that the assumption is that they have to do it, right? So they are forced by their evil governments to leave. And that's not really, not always true. They leave, like Raimondi, he leaves voluntarily, actually. He leaves voluntarily because, maybe because of the, uh, what's the word, um, you know, patronage means he hasn't got nearly so many chances to make it have a career in Milan. And I, I suspect it's got to do with, you know, a lot of people are then going both to Buenos Aires and to Lima. And they're saying, come, you know, come to Lima, we'll get you a job. Because he arrives and almost immediately gets a job in the Faculty of Medicine. So he may be just, you know, he's using a connection. So I think that this generation of people after the 1840, 40th revolutions, they make themselves unpopular, so their lives are difficult. There is a huge increase in communication, so it becomes you know, cheaper and easier to travel to, from Italy and around the world. So there's also that, and, and there's a financial incentive to do that. Um, but I think, so I think there's also, but I think there's also a chronology. I think some of them, some of them are very successful. Some of them come back. I mean, if I had more time, uh, or, yeah, if I had more time, I would talk about this other guy, Paolo Mantegazza, this doctor, this a doctor anthropologist who goes to Argentina at the same time as Raimondi, who's very like Raimondi, except he goes home to Italy. So, you know, he manages to, to go back and make a very successful career. Um, but they are all part of a network um, of Italians, yes, I think that's right, but not just Italians. Um, this guy that I just found last week, this Felice Giordano, uh, who's an engineer, who's the one who was sent out to see if the Italians can colonize Borneo, and then comes here to see what they can do in Peru. He's clearly being sent out on a mission by the Italians, and he's also, again, he's one of these political radicals. So, I'm sorry, so the, the, the problem that I have is that um, because the, I think the narrative, the historical narrative of the 19th century is so established and so, you know, and so clear that if you don't fit into that narrative, you just get forgotten, right? Uh, and so what I'm trying to do is to tell a different story about the 19th century, one that makes us see the 19th century in a different way. But it's very, it's very difficult. Um, so, you know, and one that doesn't start with the British Empire. Uh, and doesn't end, start with the British Empire and end up with the US, you know, because that's, that's, uh, it really makes me cross, you know. Because <laughs> uh, it's just not, it's not, and, I'll, and then I'll, sorry, I'll then stop because you probably have to go, but also, I think, you know, it's not what historians, and if you, if you talk to early modernists, it's not what you do, but it's what 19th century historians, we still have that heritage that we're supposed to be kind of telling a story that is in some way justifies where we are today. And I want to break through that. So my inspiration actually is early, is, is actually early modern history, early modern global history. And you study perfectly these networks. So I just have to, yeah, copy you guys. Well, we are going to conclude this journey of geographic. Thank you for your assistance, and we'll see you in the next session. Thank you.